Okay, Georgia. Um, just thought I'd do a, a few illustrations to help with these explanations. So when we're looking at um, what does it have to do with RMS power, um, basically on that page it's just a fancy derivation that um, Dr. Lowe's given to prove the power on the AC system is the same as the power on the DC system. So using RMS values for AC circuits makes it easier to intuitively know like an equivalent DC and AC because they use up the same amount of power, which is often how we're kind of gauging what we plug into these systems. So for DC, if we think about that um, voltage and time, DC is just always at its peak power. And so um, you would always want to use peak voltage and same for current. Current doesn't change over time. It's always at its max. So here you're going to get P is equal to IV because on DC, really, it's the peak every time. And that makes sense because on average, that's the voltage that you get out. So that is the effective power that you get out of the circuit. So with AC, if we want to think about this, um, we have to draw it slightly differently, remembering that AC actually goes positive and negative, positive and negative in time. And that's the same for the current as well. So the current is going to match that in phase going positive and negative, positive and negative. So if we wanted to talk about our peak power here, um, if we used peak at the tops here, um, we would be grossly overestimating how much power this circuit can actually output because as you can see, like for most of the time, you're not at the peak. So what we calculate is our RMS, our root mean squared value, and this is this is basically giving us the mean values for voltage and current. So we have it for both um, voltage and current, and it's going to be below the peak. And it's basically saying, like, on average, this is how much output you're going to get. And the way they reference that is how much power. So um, this will give us an accurate description of what the power supply will provide. And so here we're going to use power is equal to the current IRMS and the voltage RMS. And that's exactly what a user would experience. So if we used peak, we're saying, yeah, there'll be a brief moment in time where the user is going to experience a peak output that's much greater. But generally, if you're trying to plug in a device and you need to know what the demand is for it, you need to make sure you match your power requirements. So in this case, if you use your RMS, that's effectively what you're going to see. So if we plug in a light bulb here with an AC um, 12 volts RMS, and we plug in a light bulb over here with a DC 12 volts RMS, they're going to be exactly the same brightness. And that's really uh, the only thing that she's trying to get at there. So basically we're saying, for instance, like a 30 watt system in DC is going to be the equivalent power as a 30 watt system in AC. And those values, again, are referencing the RMS. So not the peak voltage or the peak current, but just on average what's going to be outputted. Um, hope that helps. And so for the next question, why does the frequency of the current change? Um, I wasn't exactly sure that I understood what you were asking for here on this page. But I'll, I'll try to talk about what I think it might be that you were getting at. So... Um, I might start with just the, the simpler question and just make sure, so this is the second paragraph, just making sure that you understand that answer. Um, if you're just asking why the current might have a different frequency, and um, the only way the current's frequency is going to change is if you actually go to like the AC source and there's going to be like knobs on here that control voltage and frequency and a few other things, and you basically just turn the frequency up or down. So the frequency is going to be constant unless you go and change it on the supply voltage. And so, um, yeah, that's the only way that the frequency is going to change. And I, I'm also not sure exactly how you're visualizing an AC source, um, but one way you can think about is like having a DC battery, but you take it out and put it back in facing the opposite direction, and you do this over and over over again, like a hundreds of tons of seconds. So, for instance, AC might look... Well, I'll just draw the battery part. AC is kind of like this. 
positive on that side and then you take it out you put it back in the other direction and now it's positive on the other side and that's not exactly what's happening but it's a good way to visualize it and then a moment later as the polarity changes what we call that it swaps direction again so it's basically kind of like visualizing a battery swapping back swapping back and forth back and forth and just changing what direction things are going in so Again, if that's what you're asking for, that's the only way that the frequencies um, of the current would change is if we actually went and turned the dial on the machine. Um, but the other thing I wasn't sure that you were asking about was um, as the capacitor starts to charge up, the potential difference between its plates and the source is less. So the effective push on the electron starts to slow down. So if we think about a DC system, um, the conventional current is going to flow out of the positive. And basically that means you've got little happy positives that are flowing along, right? And as they keep going, they're going to encounter this plate. And imagine like walking into a big room with like heaps of space in it. Or I don't know, maybe think about an elevator if you've ever done that game as you're a kid. Like how many people you can fit into an elevator. But like you get into this space, this big capacitor plate, and they see all that empty space on it. And they're like, oh, I can totally... Um, fill this up and so the charges start coming in and they can come in really rapidly at the start but as the room starts to fill up like it's a lot harder to shove people in there so like if you imagine overpacking an elevator like the more people you get in there the slower it is like the harder it is to get anybody else in there it, like takes time to rearrange everybody and one way that the, that you can visualize that here with the um, DC capacitor is you remember that the voltage chart for the capacitor over time it starts off at zero and it goes up so for instance if this is a 12 volt DC supply it's going to reach a max of 12 volts but at the start it's really z starting at zero and then it's really low so this area in here is when there's the biggest um, difference between it and the battery so between the plate and the battery and remember, it's that potential difference that makes the push on the electrons that provides that energy. So in this case, we're seeing 12 volts on the battery, and we're seeing 0 volts at the very start on the capacitor. And then in time, you're still going to see 12 volts on the battery. But, you know, after one time constant or something like that, you're going to see, you know, 8 volts roughly or something like that on the capacitor plate and so the difference between 8 and 12 is a lot less than 8 and 0 so here we've got less difference um, and so the current is slowing because the current is related to how hard of a, like a push how much potential energy the battery is able to push onto those things so here we see the current starts to slow down so that's not necessarily that the frequency is changing of the current it's just that it's slowing down like the amount of it is slowing down um, not necessarily yeah so that's one way to think about it so um, at lower frequencies um, if we think about how this affects what's going on so I'm not sure if that was your question like the difference between a low frequency and a high frequency but at a low frequency um, that means Remember, frequency is the inverse of time. So that means a low frequency is actually a lot of time passes between swapping back and forth. So a low frequency equals more time charging in one direction before the battery or the source changes polarities, changes which way it's flowing. So a low frequency, you've got more time charging in one direction. And, and that means... Um, that you're going to be able to get further up the curve. And as you get further up the curve, your voltage on the capacitor starts to increase, and you get the situation where there's less potential difference and the current is slowing down. And so that's what's happening here. The current will slow down at a low frequency. And at a high frequency, um, less time charging. Uh, in one direction before it switches. So um, if this was more time, maybe this color, 
a higher frequency is less time charging, and that means you're only getting up this far on the graph. And so you're in the situation here where you've got um, a big, uh, yeah, <laughs> sorry, a big difference, a big potential difference um, in the current. is um, still like still high so you still have a lot of current flowing there so um, hopefully that makes sense oh I was also going to say that um, this high frequency just means that the current, the electrons, or the charges are actually moving back and forth really, really fast. So you can think about them whizzing back and forth, like changing direction constantly. And so that happens very rapidly. Um, and the low, the low frequencies, when they start off fast, um, but the direction stops, as it starts, as the charges build up on the plate, that, that flowing of directions slows down, and so overall the current is less. So with the high frequency, things are changing direction really rapidly, and you see the charges wiggling back and forth very fast. At a low frequency, it might start off fast, but it generally slows down um, as the charge builds up on the plate. So overall, you get less current flowing. So to be questioned, why does the fact that a capacitor is good at holding current um, mean that the charge can flow more easily through the capacitor? So I wanted to dispel a few things that you uh, had in there a little bit. Um, first of all, the capacitor is not going to be holding current. The, the um, capacitor is going to be holding charge. So remembering that idea that if we have the positive end of the plate, that's going to provide a potential difference in a push, and we have conventional current flowing this direction again. And so the positives start to come out, and they move along, and eventually they reach that plate, and they just hang out there because there's no flow through the capacitor. It is literally like having two bags, and you can think about that with a wire connected to each side. There's no way to get between here. This is a gap. To get from one bag to the other, you've got to go around the wire or back around the other way again. So it's the same in the capacitor. But between those two metal plates, unless something fails, there's no charges going across them. So just that statement that you said there about mean that the charge can flow more easily. It's not flow more easily through the capacitor, it's flow more easily onto the capacitor. So um, what we're looking at is the, the flow of the charges, how quickly they can get onto the plates, and you end up with negatives on the other side, but there's not a flow in between. So um, remembering that idea about the charge on the capacitor, the voltage over time, it starts to increase and eventually it gets up here to the peak. Um, and this is again this idea when it's fully charged and there's no flow onto the plates anymore. So this is when the whole system's backed up. You can imagine like people just, well, you know, charges all in line. There's no more room for any of them to move and everybody's just hanging out going, okay, nothing is gonna happen now. Unless of course, like they've got some ability to discharge or move the other direction. So they're just stored up there and there's no more flow happening onto the plates. Um, and so what they're getting at on that page is why does the fact that a capacitor is good at holding charge? So here we're talking about like the actual size of the bag. So if you imagine like a, a bag that you're trying to put coins into, but I think the elevator example might be easier. Like if you have two different elevators like one's for boys and one's for girls or something, and you start racing into the elevator, like the first few people that get in there can get in there pretty fast. Um, and everybody's going really quickly in there, running in, running in, because there's some space in the elevator. But as it starts to get really cramped and you get people trying to climb in on top and everything like this, you can imagine that it's harder to do that. Everybody slows down. So it slows the flow as it fills up, as it reaches capacity, it slows the flow. And then over here on the other side, maybe you said go and it was a race between boys and girls or whatever, you've got the same thing. It went really fast at the start, but now you've got kids climbing up on top and it's slowing down 
or there's no more room for anybody and it's totally stopped. And then somebody says, okay, switch. And all the boys try to run out of the elevator and the girls try to run out of that elevator and swap sides to the other side. And again, it will go really fast at the start. People will fall out of the elevator really quickly and they'll run into the empty one really quickly, but it will slow down again as they start to get filled up. So I'm not sure if that helps kind of like try to imagine what's going on with the DC. So um, in, in the, yeah, sorry, not so much in the DC, but what's going on in the AC is that they're constantly swapping. So you've got this, this um, flow of like girls running into one elevator, boys running into the other, but as it starts to fill up, it'll slow down. But if you only allow that to happen for like an instant and you get like two people into the elevator and then you say switch and everybody turns around, like everybody's gonna be running around really fast the whole time because there's never gonna be that stagnation where like the potential difference goes away and that buildup starts to slow down. So with the AC, when you've got the high frequency, you're swapping around back and forth before the charge, before the bag, before the plate, however you want to look at it, has a chance to fill up on charge. And so in that case, nothing ever has the chance to slow down because there's always a big potential difference because you're never reaching full charge on the capacitor. You're not getting anywhere near it. So the current is going to stay really high. Um, and then, you know, if we want to try to manipulate the reactants or um, maximize the current by keeping you know the current higher we want to try to keep the reactants lower um, and so we've got two ways to do this remembering that the reactants for a capacitor is the inverse 1 over omega c or 1 over 2 pi f so there is the idea that if we um, either make the frequency a bigger number or we make the capacitor a bigger number, we're going to decrease, if either of those go up, we're going to decrease the reactant. And so again, frequency is just a dial on the machine, so that's one way to do it. We can just sort of turn the dial and change the volt or change the frequency of the current. Um, and that's basically changing the frequency of how quickly that battery is swapping back and forth, the polarity, if you want to visualize it that way. Um, so yeah, we can change the frequency and keep the capacitor the same, or we can keep the frequency the same and change the capacitor. So if you have a much bigger bag or a much bigger elevator or a much bigger capacitance, you're able to have a lot more charges running into before you start to fill up. And so that longer time period between the swapping of directions doesn't matter because you've got more capacity for people to run in or for charges to run onto the plate before they start to slow down. So they don't actually experience that slowing. And for your last question, what does the frequency have to do with the switching of current direction? Um, again, I, I get the feeling that what you're trying to ask for is, you know, how this relates to the concept of how AC works. So again, that might be helpful to visualize like magical little elves that sit inside of the voltage source and take the battery out and turn it around and put it back around the other way hundreds of times a second. And how quickly they do this or how many times a second they do this is, um, is the frequency. So how quickly that battery is swooping back and forth is your frequency. And remember that conventional current is always going to flow out of the positive. So we have current flowing this direction. And then if the magical little elf comes in and turns the whole thing over, we're going to have current flowing the opposite direction. And so that frequency, when you look at an AC time chart of the current, moving back and forth, these points where you're at zero, that's when the source has been swapped polarity. It's gone from positive to the left to positive to the right, positive to the left, positive to the right. And so here you see um, these being positive values of current and these being negative values in current. And that just means direction, basically. So depending on the circumstance, you could imagine one this first instant might be it flows clockwise and the second instant might be it's flowing anti-clockwise, but it's the same thing. The flow is happening. The direction of it doesn't necessarily matter. It's just how quickly it's moving. And so um, I don't know if that answers the question about what does the frequency have to do with the switching of the current direction. Um, the frequency itself won't 
the frequency is just related to how quickly that direction changes and it's literally just because the the polarity is swapping like the battery is swapping so there's it, yeah i don't know if that answers the question or not but it's related directly to the voltage source and what it's doing so the frequency of the voltage is really saying how quickly is the polarity is the positive on the left versus the positive on the right and that changes how quickly the electrons run to the right versus run to the left. It changes how quickly the current is changing direction. Um, I hope that answers the question.